We have Jose Antonio Campo, who will talk about the macro context that's necessary for to produce and to implement a structural transformation agenda. He served as the United Nations Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. He was the Executive Director of ECLAC, the Economic Commission on Latin America. In Santiago, he was the Minister of Finance of Colombia. He has written many, many articles and books all about macro theory, development, political economy, and social development. Among his recent books is a co-authored book with Lance Taylor and Kadrina Rada on title is Growth and Policy in Developing Countries, a Structuralist Approach. Uh, the, the topic of my talk uh, is, um, is booms and busts in, in the macroeconomy. Um, uh, so how to manage that in developing countries. Uh, that's the, the essence of the, uh, uh, of the topic. I mean, th this, uh, uh, in a sense, relates to, to the previous two in a, in a very significant way. Uh, first of all, the best social protection policy is not to have a crisis. <laughs> okay? okay? <laughs> so, uh, so crisis prevention is the best social policy. Uh, in, a, in a significant uh, sense. I mean, of course, you have to ma have many other things, but you know, there is nothing more disruptive to, uh, to people than a crisis. Um, and I guess uh, uh, countries undergoing crisis, uh, including long ones, like you know, this one is being the United States and, uh, and even more in Europe, but that's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll know that. As well as we have learned, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the developing world uh, through a, seri a, se you know, a series of crises, because we are for sure the champions of, uh, of, uh, of big crises. But the second is also for a structural transformation, because there is nothing more disruptive of a structural uh, transformation, which is a long-term process, than a, a sharp business cycle. Uh, the, uh, the incentives that are generated through the chart business cycle are much more prone to generate uh, short-term visions uh, by, by entrepreneurs uh, that, rather than the long-term vision that is required for a structural change. Okay, so that's, that's the way I, I want to relate my presentation to the, uh, uh, to the previous two ones. Now, the, uh, uh, I mean, th through a long history of, of thought, uh, particularly of Latin American thinking, uh, but also from the experience uh, in recent uh, decades, uh, we know that the main source uh, of business cycles uh, in developing countries are external shocks. External shocks, positive and negative. Uh, positive when you have a trade boom, it, you know, your commodity, commodity prices are increasing uh, or <coughs> more important today uh, uh, for most countries when you have a, a flood of capital, uh, uh, the tsunami uh, uh, being uh, the extreme form of, of, of that, uh, or, or the flood of capital. But then you go through the opposite, uh, which is when your commodity prices uh, collapse, uh, your uh, you know, trade partners uh, collapse, I mean, uh, including manufacturing, for example, we saw the uh, you know, the uh, you know, many ma ma major manufacturing countries uh, interrupting their, you know, their growth process uh, uh, as a result of Lehman Brothers, uh, the Lehman Brothers crisis, or when uh, financing dries out. So in, in financing in particular, uh, you know, you go through, through these uh, very irregular flows of water. You know, you go from floods to deserts, okay, of financing, and managing that issue is, uh, I mean, that is a major source, uh, I would argue the major source uh, of business cycles in developing countries. So, and that's what uh, I, I come with the, this concept that is in the title of my presentation, which I call balance of payment dominance. So I, I've come to, to, to call this balance of payment dominance because it is really the balance of payment that dominates the way your macroeconomy works through booms and busts. But by the way, it's a different concept to others. For instance, it's different from external gap. I'm talking actually about also booms. And second, it's different from the Dutch disease. The Dutch disease is a particular issue when you have a long-term commodity prices, commodity price boom, and you have to manage. So both external, you know, external gaps and, 
And those you see is a long-term phenomenon. Not, I'm talking about the succession of booms and busts. That is what generates uh, your uh, you know, short uh, business uh, cycles. Now, the complication, uh, the, the major complication, is that the same circumstances, the same factors that generate your business cycle also limit the capacity to act. Uh, so they, they really limit the, your co capacity to do counter-cyclical policies, uh, to, to, do your macro, to manage your macroeconomy in order to avoid. And, and this is particularly true, and I'll come back to this in the case uh, of the management of capital flows. Because when you have a flood, an inflow of capital, uh, uh, in uh, international markets for, you know, for emerging economies or for developing countries in general, uh, that is, for example, a company for, uh, with a reduction in the cost of financing. So you get more financing and also at cheaper terms, okay? And generally also longer, you know, longer maturities. So, it, that's, so there's three phenomena. You have more financing of longer maturities and, and, and cheaper. Uh, so the, the, the incentives to spend that are monumental. <laughs> and monetary policy, uh, in a sense, interest rate fault, I mean, which is the opposite of what central banks are supposed to do in a boom, which is to increase interest rates right, in, to, in order to stop demand. Actually, the incentives generated by markets are to reduce your uh, interest rates. And the opposite happens during crisis. Uh, so during crisis, developing countries generally uh, I mean, uh, markets uh, uh, generate a, an increase in risk premium, which means that interest rates tend to go up. So at the time you are supposed to do ex monetary expansion, cheaper interest rates, like you know, the normal thing the, the Federal Reserve does in, in this country during crisis, uh, you know, markets actually are pushing uh, emerging markets in the opposite direction, that is to increase interest rates. I mean, this is a story that, that is uh, you know, very well known from, uh, from our history. So, so the same factors that generate the, the business cycle actually limit your capacity to act. So they limit your policy space for countercyclical macroeconomic policy. So the, 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 basic, the basic challenge of these conditions is how you recreate the possibilities, the policy space for managing those booms and busts, okay? So that's the topic that, uh, and, uh, and let me say that uh, I, you know, in a paper that I, I, I wrote a few years ago, I call it, you know, a broad, a broad view of macroeconomic stability, which is interesting. Um, and I'll, you know, just briefly refer to that. Actually, I'm, I'm happy because it's actually one of my most quoted papers. So, uh, uh, and it's, saying it's actually quite interesting uh, because the, the concept, you know, when people say macroeconomic stability in the orthodox jargon, means prices, period, right? But it really means more than prices because macroeconomic stability is also many other things. For instance, and I'll refer to the exchange rate stability. You know, you have, you know, volatile exchange rates, uh, the incentives for uh, producing, uh, you know, exports and, and to compete with imports are very unstable. Uh, so that's also a form of instability. But the most important form of instability is not generally called instability, actually, macroeconomic instability, which is short business cycles, so booms and busts in economic activity. That's also, so, so macroeconomic stability, uh, and not to say financial stability, which is uh, also a major form of stability. So, so the concept of stability uh, came to, to mean too little uh, in the uh, last three decades. I mean, very different from the time I, I studied uh, you know, economics uh, back a few decades ago. Uh, when uh, still Keynesian thinking was dominant, and, and I am the first thing that, uh, that you will be taught in the macroeconomic course is that the basic objective of, of, um, of macroeconomic policy is to generate full employment. Okay, that was the basic objective of macroeconomic policy. Very different to what is being taught today, and particularly because the obsession with price stability dominates all of macroeconomics, uh, contemporary macroeconomics. So, you know, say that stability means everything, including uh, the business cycle. So how do you recreate the space for that? So let me start by, you know, with the obvious case. I mean, actually, the, in theoretically, the best and easiest case to study, which is fiscal policy, okay? So you are supposed to do, you know, try to, exp you know, contract uh, during the booms, uh, your spending, or increase taxes, and do the opposite during crisis, okay? So you reduce... Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, 
you know, after Lehman Brothers, uh, you know, we the Keynesians finally said, oh, we won. You know, this is the Keynesian consensus. You know, uh, this is a crisis. You know, it's supposed to be expansionary policies. Okay, uh, four years later, uh, it's unclear that we won. Okay, and particularly in Europe, uh, it's actually exactly the opposite now. Uh, and, uh, but also, I guess, uh, in the, in, even in the U.S. debate. Uh, but debate your problem, um, uh, I mean, there are many complications here, but I, I will just highlight one which I actually think is the most important, which is a political economy issue. If, if, a, if, a, if, fiscal, if governments uh, are forced to do contractionary fiscal policy during crisis, that they are forced to adjust because the market doesn't want to finance them, uh, you know, which is, the, I guess, the uh, countries of Europe, uh, or because you know, there is you know, some ideological resistance to fiscal expansion, like here, uh, then uh, what happens, or, or, or in many developing countries, you know, the IMF comes and tells you, you, know, you have to have fiscal adjustment because uh, otherwise you're going into a crisis, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the reason. But if you are forced to do a contractionary uh, fiscal policy during crisis, then the political economy becomes impossible for countercyclical policies during the boom. So when, when times comes, you know, become better, you cannot go to the public, you know, any, no government can go to the public and say, now, all we have to do contractionary fiscal policy because we are in the boom. Wow, well, come on, you said that, you know, a few years when you were in the crisis. So, uh, so you know, it, the political economy, you do cont fiscal contraction during a crisis, it's impossible not to end up doing pro-cyclical fiscal policy. And that's actually what happens in practice in developing countries, which have been told for a long time that they have to do, uh, you know, they, they have to adjust during crisis, uh, you know, so the pattern of, of fiscal spending is actually pro-cyclical. So the, uh, you know, there is a tendency to spend during booms, uh, and then they are forced, governments are forced to contract during crisis. So instead of, so, the, so you do have to have a lot of, uh, a, you know, a, create new institutions in order to manage this, you have to create rules, for example, fiscal rules that it will determine uh, uh, some fiscal targets in the function of long-term uh, uh, fiscal balances rather than short-term uh, you know, uh, disequilibria. Uh, you have to have perhaps fiscal stabilization funds, so uh, particularly for commodity exporters, uh, you save part of your money, your revenues during the, you know, in, in funds uh, to be able to spend during the crisis. So you have to create new institutions that will allow you to break that you know, vicious circle uh, generated by, by that political economy dynamics. Well, in the case of monetary and exchange rate policies, uh, the, uh, the problem is that the market directly uh, uh, tends to push uh, 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 the, polit you know, the, uh, the management, the macroeconomic management, in the sense of procyclical policy. So, so the market tends to reduce interest rate during booms and to increase them during crisis. Uh, or uh, if, if you try to, to avoid that, and try to increase interest rate during the booms, then what happens is that you'll have a exchange rate appreciation uh, during the booms, and then exchange rate depreciation during the crisis when you uh, in, uh, increase um, interest rate during crisis. So one way of saying this is that in practice, uh, authorities cannot control both the interest rate and the exchange rate, which is a typical um, uh, issue um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in they say macroeconomic analysis uh, of open economies. But then what, what happens if you cannot control both, you cannot do countercyclical policies. Because you can argue, and, and this is of course something that, um, that uh, you try to do it through, through the exchange rate, uh, you actually end up doing procyclical policies again. So suppose you, know, you are a monetary policy, you know, you're a central bank of a developing country. Uh, you have a boom, you're you know, having a flood of capital, uh, so you say, no, 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 I'm going to, uh, to try to control uh, you know, uh, uh, demand, and so I, I'll increase interest rates. So what happens immediately uh, is, first of all, you, you're flooded with even more capital. So you, it's unclear whether you are able to control the source uh, of, the, uh, of the abundance, let's say. Uh, and secondly, the exchange rate appreciation generates a massive capital gains for all debtors in foreign currency. Uh, which, of course, will tend to spend that, you know, part of the capital gain, okay? 
So th there, there are some countercyclical effects through trade, but those generally dominate. So, so you're actually not doing countercyclical policy by increasing interest rates during the boom because the effect of the exchange rate uh, is going to be counterproductive from that point of view. And you can argue it's exactly the opposite, let's say, for the, for the crisis, okay? So, uh, now, how do you end up, you know, breaking that, um, uh, again, that's, that, that constraint? Uh, in my view, uh, the only way to do that, and I think what many uh, developing countries, central banks, have been learning, is that you have to have more instruments. So you cannot rely only on interest rates. You have to create more instruments. You have to be active. Uh, and, and a simple way, I mean, we have in economics this Timbergen rule that we have to have uh, at least uh, as many uh, instruments as objectives of, of macroeconomic policy. But I would say, in general, you have to have many more instruments than, than objectives for the simple re reason that many of your instruments are not uh, capable of doing the job. Uh, because the market actually may push the, the, you in the, in the wrong direction. Um, so the, uh, uh, and, and, and that means, you know, you have to create no more interest. I actually, this is an area in which this crisis uh, has actually done quite a good job by, you know, uh, generating leg legitimacy for things that we have been saying for a long time but were not acceptable. That you, re you have to include new instruments. And what are the instruments? First of all, you have to regulate the source uh, of, the, um, of the boom, which is the, the excessive inflow of capital. Okay, so the first thing you want to do maybe is to intervene and try to reduce the inflow of capital, okay? Uh, which is what is generally called capi you know, capital controls of some sort. Uh, I think it's a wrong name. It's also ideological that you know, when you regulate finance, you call it regulation. But when you intervene in, ca you know, cross-country capital, you know, flows of finance, uh, then you call them controls, okay, they're bad, okay? Uh, you know, the, so the terminology itself, you know, has been, uh, so I said, no, for a long time, I said, no, let's, let's keep the language clear. These are capital account regulations. It's one form of financial regulations, except that in this case, they apply to cross-country uh, flows, okay? So it's not intra-country uh, finance, uh, financial flows. So you may have to do that because uh, of the character. So let's say the United States doesn't need that for one simple reason. When there is an international crisis, this country, so there, uh, a crisis, you get flooded with capital. So you have counter-cyclical financing. We have pro-cyclical financing. You know, when crisis comes, money runs out, runs out okay? It runs to the US. <laughs> uh, so, the, so that's the basic reason why you have, any, you have to have an instrument that actually um, uh, uh, does that job. The second is, um, uh, you have to uh, have many more, uh, much more intervention in the foreign exchange market. Essentially, uh, the central banks uh, become uh, regulators of the, of the floods, okay? So what you do, essentially, is during booms, you accumulate huge amounts of international reserves to be able to manage uh, the crisis, okay? So the second is, uh, and I think that's, that's even... Uh, whereas the return to capital account regulations has been mixed uh, now even with the blessing of the International Monetary Fund, which has accepted that they are part of the recipe uh, for, uh, for the management of, uh, of emerging markets. Uh, the, uh, the other part, the uh, accumulation of foreign re exchange reserve is a normal practice in the developing countries, uh, particularly since the Asian crisis. Uh, but uh, you can say even in the 1990s, after the Latin American and African uh, debt crisis, uh, but particularly since the Asian crisis, uh, is a quite normal practice. So the developing countries in general accumulated massive amount of reserves after the Asian crisis because they learned that that was the only way to manage crisis, to have a lot of, uh, re uh, of reserves. And then you can think of many other instruments, uh, uh, which is what now uh, has become to call macroprudential regulations which is really ways of managing finance, uh, uh, booms and busts, uh, partic but particularly booms because busts of finance are generally uh, the result of a, ma in a badly managed boom, okay? So, you, so the best case here is like in, in a, with uh, social protection, the best thing is to avoid the crisis. And, and that's what, you know, financial regulation. So macroprudential regulation is essentially ways of trying to contain the credit booms uh, which may be at the, global, uh, at, the, at, the, at the country level as a whole, or by sectors which may be uh, 
uh, you know, let's say mortgage uh, or whatever other uh, are undergoing. So I think you could do that, but raising capital requirements, raising, re raising liquidity requirements, there are many other uh, ways of doing that, okay? <coughs> so my, my point is, uh, when you are faced with, uh, with these uh, uh, procyclical shocks and you have, and your policies uh, instruments are limited by that, uh, the only way uh, to uh, do countercyclical policy is actually to enhance, to multiply your instruments. And I would say uh, the recent crisis uh, showed that, uh, in general terms, that recipe is correct. I mean, uh, I think central banks started to do many of these things, not because the theory told them, because actually the theory told them not to do that. <laughs> okay, there is nothing in the theory that was prevalent before the international financial crisis that told central banks of the developing world they had to have massive amount of reserves, or that maybe you know, it was good to have capital controls or you know, capital account regulations uh, during booms. They had, they generally were forced to do that and, and did them. But I think there's a, 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 a now a, 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 an increasing uh, literature that shows that you know, the virtues of, of having multiplied the instruments uh, and I would say that um, when you think of, the, of this literature, I would say that the explanation of why uh, many, several developing countries and, or emerging markets and developing countries were successful uh, is because they, they had uh, either of one, uh, you know, a combination of five basic factors. They had lower current account deficits, so they avoided uh, going into deficit during the booms uh, as a result of exchange rate appreciation. They have competitive exchange rates they have high levels of foreign exchange reserves. They have reduced short-term external liabilities, so they try to contain uh, short-term indebtedness, uh, or they had capital account regulations uh, to manage that. So I would say that there is a generally growing literature that shows that that was the source uh, of, the, uh, of the gains, and that's why I think emerging markets and uh, developing countries did much better during this crisis than industrial economies. Uh, and I think the basic lesson is that. And let me finish uh, with just one connection, a final connection, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the issue that Mario uh, presented here, which is the issue of the exchange rate. I mean, the exchange rate is, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Danny uh, 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 last night uh, presented that you, know, is, you, know, you can have industrial policies and or in a, a, a very competitive exchange rates, okay? I would say, uh, that is uh, generally correct, and I guess Mario uh, is in that uh, club, and I more or less belong to that club. Uh, but I will emphasize one further thing, which is exchange rate stability of some sort. Because the, uh, you know, one of the things that you know, many central banks are taught today is that flexible exchange rates are the best. Flexible exchange rates, yes, are the best in terms of trying to manage you know, uh, uh, changes in the supply of, uh, of foreign exchange. Okay, so you, you, you know, they help um, the macroeconomy. But they are, at the same time, the worst instrument for, for industrial diversification. Uh, for one basic reason, again, is that the exchange rate stability also matters, okay? Also matters. And, uh, uh, and uh, if you have a very unstable exchange, uh, exchange rate, you are also going to have very unstable incentives for, uh, for exporters and, and for uh, firms that are competing with imports. So you actually are you know, increasing instability of incentives uh, independently of the level of, of the exchange rate. So I think the, the issue of, uh, and, and this is very important because here uh, there is a sort of a schizophrenia in orthodox thinking. Because on the one hand, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, say, well, you we have to have you know, flexible exchange rate. You know? But at the same time, you, know, uh, you must integrate into global markets. I think this is, that's a schizophrenic recommendation. You, you cannot tell the same uh, country, you know, go integrate into global markets and then give very unstable incentives to any firm that integrates into global markets. That is, the, that is exactly the recipe that we have been receiving for a long time. And I think we have to, I mean, when we talk about structural change, we have to rethink uh, that you know, schizophrenic recommendation. Thank you very much.